The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Well, a very good morning to all of you. If you're visiting with us this morning, welcome. I hope you are you are comfortable here in the midst of family and friends, and we would love to get to know you and meet you if you are with us. And please, afterwards, we would have some elders up here come and see us. And um, Ken is taking a break from his series on the theme of Christmas and what led up to the Christmas. And so as he takes this break, I thought I would jump in and, and bring something that started out at the elders' meeting. We are all assigned um, a title of the name, a name of Christ. And then t- two weeks ago, I gave my title that was the bread of life, the bread of life. What was a two-minute devotional turned into a 10-minute flop. And so, and when we realized we didn't have someone to preach, uh, they all turned to me, why don't you preach on this, Ray? And, uh, and uh, led by no other. <laughs> let me, uh, before I get into too much trouble here, let me pray for us. Father, you are good to us every day, every day, all the time every hour of every season. So would you be please continue that to be good to us in the next hour or so as we turn our hearts from the busyness of life, of the distractions of life to Lord, to you, the bread of life. And may we eat of your word and drink and taste of the sweetness of the Savior. Father God, grass withers, flowers fade, and the word of the Lord endures forever and ever and ever. Would you make it please endure in our hearts this morning? Amen. Amen. So if you would take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We will do a flyover of this passage here. John chapter 6, starting at verse 26 to verse 35. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. Therefore they said to him, What shall we do so that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign? so that we may see and believe you. What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread out of heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always, always give us this bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will not thirst. And ending in verses 58 This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogues as he taught in Capernaum. There is what we call, or what Christian theologians call, the universal Restlessness 
of the soul that causes life spiritual hunger and life spiritual pursuit to happiness that would satisfy the hunger of the soul. And this morning, as we look at John 6, I feel like that saying that we always say preachers and pastors is one hungry man telling another hungry man where to get free bread. This is true here in John 6. This this conversation that was going back and forth between the Jews and Jesus was in the synagogue of Capernaum. It is the application, if you will, and the spiritual lesson of the feeding of the 5,000 that took place the day before. So as we fly over this rapidly here, I want us to notice three themes that, comes out, that come out of this. Number one, if you like outlines, here's, here's our outline. Seekers, signs, and full bellies. Number two, the true bread of life. And number three, eating is believing. Eating is believing. So as we begin with the signs and the seekers and the full bellies here, we drop right in the middle of this conversation. It, it is, it's hot, it's heated, so to speak. Getting a little sarcastic with the Lord, a little offensive and a little testy. He had just fed the 5,000. Verses 25, 26, look with me. With verse 25, he says, When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. 24 hours earlier in Christ's ministry, the crowd saw plenty of signs. As a matter of fact, if you turn to chapter 6, verse 1, John writes, points out, he sets up the day for us. Verse 1, after these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. It was a desolate, it was a deserty, desolate place. Some people identify it's the modern Golan Heights that's hardly contested. A large crowd followed him, and here's why, because they saw signs. They saw signs which he was performing, and on those who were sick, who were sick and diseased. And so the thing that we have to say about miraculous signs that we want to point out as we start here, because it, the theme keeps coming up in this passage, signs signify or signify a reality, someone. They're not, signs and miracles are not an end to themselves. But they're a means in nature to, to point to a reality and to someone. They lead the attention of a spectator away from the deed, the sign itself, to the divine doer. Signs point away to something. Before Jesus opened the man born blind. He said, I am the light of the world. Before he raised Lazarus, he said, I am the resurrection and to life to Martha. And here in the feeding of the 5,000 in verse 35, he's going to tell them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. In all the signs here, and in all the bread, it signifies someone. There were hungry people in the thousands, men and women. What's interesting here is between verses 5 and 13, as you make your way through the text, you have, you have hungry people. Yeah, in the thousands. It says, John says there are 5,000 men alone not adding women and children. You have the disciples who are worried. 
the enormous need and task to not only feed 5,000, but to serve 5,000. And you have a young lad who's ready to share his loaves and fishes. And there stood the incarnate Son of God. This miracle is a unique one. This sign is a very, very unique sign. And the Lord is about to make point of that. It is the only miracle that is mentioned in all four Gospels. All other miracles were healing the sick and raising the dead. They were amended miracles and restoring what already existed. This was pure creation. This miracle was different. It was pure creation of bread and fish. This was the most public miracle. It, has been, it had been seen by more people than any other miracle in the gospel. Verse 14, the people make the application. He says, what were the crowd to make of this miracle? Therefore, when the people in verse 14 saw the sign, here's, another, here's the word again. When they saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. Thinking in Deuteronomy 18 that at what Moses had told them, someone like him, the Lord your God would raise up for you a prophet like me from amongst your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. The sign was all about the sign. It wasn't pointing anymore to just someone, but back to themselves. They said, we got ourselves a prophet like Moses, free bread, maybe for 40 years. We'll make him king. This would have been a political agenda. They hated being under Rome. They hated the ruling party. They turned the miracles, miraculous signs into themselves. Their concept of the kingdom was political, was materialistic. His was spiritual. This was the wrong application. So wrong that immediately, immediately Jesus perceiving, verse 15, that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew immediately again to the mountain. Satan would have loved this. Satan would would have loved to set up Jesus as a social worker or as a political leader or, or make him into some sort of a bread dispensing machine. They were caught up in the product rather than the person. Matthew 14, 22, it says, Immediately he made his disciples get in the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. And he sent the crowd away and went up to the mountain to pray. And in verses 17 through 22, we know, most of us know the scene there. Christ is walking on the water. The, the disciples are in this little dinghy boat, and they're straining against the storm and against the wind. And here comes the Messiah walking on water, gets in, and the passage says he, immediately they were at the shore. In the middle of the night, he defies gravity, he defies space, and he defies time. The next day, here comes the crowd. Verse 24, seeking. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Verse 25, and they found him, and on the other side of the sea, they said to him, they were puzzled. We saw your disciples get in the boat, and there was no other boat. How did you get here? When did you get here? Christ could have had fun with this, and he could have said, I walked here last night. But no, he would not entertain. He would not entertain. He does not answer their curiosity. They were curious. He knows why they're there. He knows why they're looking for him. This was the wrong question to ask Christ. The right question would have been at that moment, Rabbi, who are you? Who are you? Nobody does this thing. 
That was the wrong question, but it was a question. It was a question. Verse 26. Jesus doesn't answer, but he answers this. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and you were filled. This is, it wasn't just about signs anymore. It was about food. It was about physical. It was about filling their bellies. This is like the lowest of all lows. It's not just show us signs. It's keep it coming. Thus, his statement, you seek me because you ate and were filled. Christ drills down right here. He doesn't let them get away with it. He drills down right here. Here's his first spiritual answer. For the feeding of the 5,000. Verse 27. Look with me. Do not, he says to them, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, and the Father God set his seal on him. And in reality, the statement of Christ, what he's saying, he's, he's asking and he's answering a question. And the question he would be asking is, and he probably asked us today, what are you working for? What are you working for? And the idea of work here is, what are you striving? What are you striving at? What are you exhausted over? Do not work for food which perishes. He's talking spiritually. He's not talking about giving up your nine to five job. He's talking about spiritual seeking. He's talking about spiritual work, spiritual feeding. There is a kind of work, there's a kind of striving, there's a kind of seeking, there's a kind of pursuing that might seem right and true and noble and might seem promising and lasting and satisfying. But at the end of the day, it is physical, it is temporal, and it is self-oriented. I know not many of us here in this room are seeking Christ because we have empty bellies and we want free bread. But how many today are seeking Christ to have their felt needs itched and filled how many are turning ministry and serving God and striving just so they can have meaning and purpose in life? I remember a time in my own life, anything I touched, it prospered. My plate was full. There was ministry on all places. There was work, made a lot of money. There was investment. It turned really good. We moved, I remember, back to California. Work went away. Ministry went away. Investment went away. <sighs> My marriage almost went away. And I remember sitting in the back of a pew at a church which... I would not even go to. And I remember the Lord is saying to me, Ray, am I enough? Am I enough for you? Am I enough? Not the stuff of life, but am I enough? Is he the bread of life for us? And Christ turns this upside down. We think we think happy are they, the blessed. And he says, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. He says, but work for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. 
work for the gift. And this working is believing the gift and the gift giver. The food of God in this context right here is God himself. It's not bread. It's not meat. It's not fish. It's God himself. It's not purpose in life. It's not meaning. I follow Jesus. I'm so happy. It gives me meaning of life. Talk to someone in trials. It's not family. It's not career. It's not upgrading your life. It's not ministry, serving God. It's the person of God. The work of God is to believe God. I often ask men, businessmen in my life, the question, what could God produce and give you right here, right now, that deep down in your soul you could say, "Ah, I got it. I got it. Right there, right there in the depth of your soul, in the solitude of your soul, is where you know if you have the bread of life or not. Right there in the depth of your heart. What could God give you? What could God give you? You know, that's the test of, do you love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? Do you feed on Him? Do you feed on Him? I think the Lord might be thinking of Isaiah 55. Listen to this. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what is not, does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Stop living on the crumbs of this world and the husks of life. Live on the bread of life. There's a kind of work, there's a kind of food that perishes. There's something, there's a kind of pursuit that you fill your heart, your soul, your life, where your mind constantly goes to. You're feeding yourself on this. This is an age old. Verse 28, therefore they said to him, what shall we do so that we, work, we may work the works of God? He just told them the works of God is to believe. It's a free gift. And then he says to them, this is the bread of life. The bre- believe, believe. It's a gift. It's an age-old question. What must I do to be saved? What must I work? I got to do something. Nothing is free. Here's a question. Why is free grace, why is free grace, the free gift of God to humanity, is the biggest obstacle for us and for the Jews to come over, to get over? Why is grace free Grace so difficult to, uh, for us to get. Because grace and faith kills the human pride. Grace and faith kills the human pride and the human doing. It renders human pride as dead. And it's hard for us to get over that. It's hard. Boyce, James Boyce is so eloquent in this. He says... The human mind is always flattered when it, when it is conscious of doing something for God. You know, it is so true. When I was on drugs, when I was an alcoholic and I dealt drugs, and I, I didn't struggle with self-righteousness. I didn't struggle with works. I knew exactly where I'm at. As I came into the church, and I came to see what works, and, and my pride needed to be dealt with. That was the hardest thing for me to get over, my self-righteousness. Oh, God will be happy with you. He's got a great deal with you. 
Jesus, verse 29, answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Don't work and strive for what God provides, but labor and work to see God and believe God himself. It's not what you do for him. It's not what you get from him. It's him. It's him. The gift of God is, the, is God. The gift of God is God. Verse 30. Here comes more insults from the Jews. So they said to him, What then do you do for a sign so that we may see and believe you? What works do you perform? We're back to signs again. What our fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and it is written, they thought Moses gave it to them. He gave them the bread of heaven. This was a comparative insult to the Lord. What they're saying is, you fed 5,000, Moses fed hundreds of thousands. You fed us for one day, Moses fed us for 40 years. You fed us from bread, second hand. Moses fed us from bread from heaven. Miracles breed miracles. Miracles breed craving for even more miracles. You can't live on signs and wonders. You have to live by faith alone in Jesus Christ. 32, Jesus then said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who gave you, who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you. And here comes the first hint, the true bread out of heaven. Verse 33, for the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. It is not the stuff of religion. It's the Savior. It's not the loaves. It's the life of the Savior is what gives you life. Verse 34, then they said to him, Lord, <laughs> always give us this bread. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. We heard this. Lord, ever give me this living water, the Samaritan woman said. Jesus didn't come to solve world hunger, but he came to solve world damnation. Jesus did not come on a social justice mission. Jesus came on a social deadness mission. Jesus did not come to be a bread dispenser, but to give life. Verse 34, the conversation sort of comes to a halt. Jesus gets very direct and he begins his sermon. He begins his sermon right here, his discourse. And here comes the second point. The claim of Jesus Christ, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. This phrase, I am the bread of life, needs to be divided and parsed for a moment. First thing he claims, the I am, the highest most sacred name in the Old Testament. When God revealed to, him, to himself to Moses, who did he say? He said in Exodus 3, 14, he says, tell him I am has sent you. I am has sent you. And, and describes, there is Jewish tradition that describes when they would transcribe that name, Yahweh, the I am. They would hush everybody around them so they would not miswrite it. And some of the scribes will take a shower before and after the name is written. It was the highest, most sacred name that the Lord is claiming here. I am the Exodus of the Exodus 3.14. No one dared to proclaim that name or even pronounce it. In the Septuagint Greek, when that name was transferred over, it was translated as Ego Iami. It is a little weird what he's doing, what he's claiming here, he's, he, the, the, the Greek puts the pronoun, the I, with the verb I am, and literally says this, I, I am. Ego, I am. I, I am. Expressing uniquely the eternal, pre 
existence of the great I am. 23 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus applied this to, applies this to himself. Seven out of the 23, the I am is, at, is attached to a metaphor. And you all know this. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection. I am the way. And lastly, I am the vine. I am the vine. The first is I am the bread of life. What is, what is the implication? What is the implication of this phrase? I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. It's the all sovereign, self existing, all sufficient God is the giver and the sustainer of eternal life. And he is using the metaphor of bread to communicate that to them and to us. And they got hung up on the bread. They got hung up on the bread. It is all over the text here. Five times, verse 32, he is the true bread out of heaven. Verse 33, the bread of God. Verse 35, I am the bread of life. Verse 48, I am the bread of life again. Verse 51, I am the living bread. So when Jesus says, I am the bread of life, what is he saying? What, what, what did bread mean in a Jewish culture? It means very different to us today. I know to these days bread has fallen on hard times. Gluten-free, <laughs> good grief. Sorry. I went, went out to a restaurant, and they had all these codes, like five, ten codes next to that. I'm like, can I get some bread? I got crackers. <laughs> bread was the staple of life, the old English, the staff of life in a in a gregarian agrarian culture it is it imparts life it imparts strength it sustains life it satisfies the hunger rich and poor lived on it old and young needed it 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 nourishes life it gives energy it gives vitality it's the daily staple it, it was the most basic food, but it was the most necessity and the most necessary food. Without bread, in those days, you died. Even growing up in the Middle East, you walk into a Middle Eastern house for a meal, the first thing that comes down is bread. And the last thing that's even taken up after the meal is bread. Some homes will even have baskets right on the table with bread on it, wrapped in plastic. There is bread always available. It's life. Water and bread had become the emblem of life. And Jesus is claiming right here, I am, I am the bread of life. No bread, no life. No bread, no life. This claim was very uniquely made by the Son alone. No one has ever made this claim. No one will ever make this claim. Not Muhammad, not Confucius, not Buddha, not any king, not any emperor, not any prophet, not any angel, not any Abraham, not Moses, not David, not Paul, not Calvin, not Augustine. No one will ever say, is able to say, I am the bread of life. No one is great enough, sufficient enough, perfect enough, satisfying enough to claim such deity and such sufficiency in their life. The Jews understood this, but the implication they did not get. They said to themselves, and they were grumbling, because he said, I am the bread of life that came out of heaven. They posed the question, in verse 42, they were saying, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? At this point, Christ could have said, hold it, guys. Hold it. Let me, let me move. Let's move back. Let's, let's cool it off. Let's settle down. Maybe misapplication, some, some uh, control in the crowd here. Jesus presses the point 
and he wants to make the application for them. In verse, he pushes the point. In verse 49, he says, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. Verse 50, I am the bread which comes down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and eat it and not die. The bread that your fathers ate sustained physical life. I am the bread that gives spiritual, eternal, everlasting life to the world. Not only to the Jews, but to the world. And in verses 51 through 58, he pushes the point. Not just being the person of the bread of life. Then he starts talking about Calvary, about his body and about his blood. Unless you eat his body and his blood. Unless you believe on the person and the works of Jesus Christ. You would die. Look at verse the offering is eating. Verse 49, your fathers ate to the manna in the wilderness and they died. The idea of eating, this is the bread which, verse 50, would come down of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. Verse 55, this gets really hairy here. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Is Jesus advocating cannibalism? Absolutely not. Is he talking about the communion table that we would celebrate today? Absolutely not. What he's saying is eating is believing and believing is eating. That's what he's saying. Don't miss the metaphor. They missed the point. Verse 52, they started grumbling. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? How can he literally, how, how, do, how is he thinking he's going to impart himself to us? Eating and drinking in the text and in other places is a spiritual metaphor of taking something or someone in. Let me help us with this. Psalm 80 verse 5 says this, You have fed me with, you have fed them with the bread of tears. Sorrow and sadness has been their food like bread. Isaiah 30 verse 20, Although the Lord has given you bread of privation or the bread of affliction, my tears have been my food day and night. What are these authors saying? My sorrow, my life, my trials is what I've been eating on day in, day out. Are they talking about literal bread? Of course not. They're talking about their internal life, what they're feeling and what they're sensing deep down inside in their soul. My soul has been so gripped by trials, I feel like I've been eating the bread of adversity. It's been my food. That's what I've been feeding on. So here is the point for them and for us. Eating is a spiritual metaphor for believing in Christ Jesus. Eating is a spiritual metaphor. It's a picture of believing in Christ Jesus. Coming to Him, seeing Him, believing in Him. That's how we feed. That's how we feed Back in verse 29, he says that you may believe in him whom he sent. Verse 35, right after he said, I am the bread of life, he says, he who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Verse 40, everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him. Verse 47, he who believes has eternal life. Christ is equating eating to believing, to coming to him. That is the staple. Faith and believe is the staple of the Christian life. I am the bread of heaven. Just like God sent you manna in the wilderness to sustain your life, He has sent me into the world to give life. He's the giver and He's the gift. He's the giver and He's the gift. 
It's not just breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's eternal life. Verse 53, Christ presses even deeper. Once more, he doubles down on his application. And, he's, and, 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 and in a sense, of he wants them to appropriate this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink of his blood, you have no life in yourself. He doesn't give them an, he gives them an ultimatum. He doesn't say, oh, you could taste and see, you could nibble on this, you could. He says, unless you eat of this bread, this particular bread, and believe on it, and eat, drink of the blood, believe on the work of Jesus Christ, you will die in yourselves. You can't sustain yourself. Look at, what does it mean to appropriate? What does it mean to eternalize? Like bread, Christ must be personally appropriated. Like bread, Christ must be personally believed in, eaten. No one can eat for you. No one can believe for you. He must be eternalized, taken in. You can't just taste him. You can't just taste him. You can't just sniff at him. You can't just study him. You don't study bread. Okay, I sniff bread before I eat it. But you don't just sniff bread. You don't just hold it and look at it. You eternalize it. You eat it. And it's so good. You getting hungry yet? He must be... He must be lived on continually for nourishment and sustaining. Like bread, he must be assimilated into us. To take in, to utilize nourishment, to absorb into our system, to take in in the deepest, profoundest way. And that is by faith. Listen to John Flavel. The soul is the life of the body. Faith is the life of the soul. And Christ is the life of your faith. Christ is the life of your faith. One last important thought here, verse 56. I'm going to call this union faith or faith union. He, verse 56 says, He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. What's What's interesting about the bread of life statement, the first metaphor that the Lord uses is, I am the bread of life. And the last metaphor that the Lord uses is, I am the true vine. Both bread and vine must be internalized and must be abided in. Turn with me to John 15, just for a moment. John 15. I would read, I've taught on this passage. Verse 6 seems harsh. My mind, my eyes always went to the second part of the passage. If anyone does not abide in me, he is, number one, thrown away as a branch. Number two, dries up. Number three is they gather them. Number four, they cast them into the fire. And number five, they're burned. My mind always went to that. Oh, man. And if you look what the Lord is saying in John 15, 6, he's not saying, unless you bear fruit, you're burned and taken away. He's saying, unless you abide, unless the branch abides in me, unless I have all of you and you have all of me, and there's that union and there's that communion with one another, I have no part in you, and you have no part in me. There's no middle ground. There's no semi-detached branch here. There's no sniffing at the bread of life. There's taking in. The more we take him in, the more we believe him, the more we trust him, the more we glorify him and give him glory. So application for us. Many of us in here have been feeding on the bread of life. 
You're not looking for signs. You're not looking for wonders. You're not trying to use service and ministry to work yourself in favor with God. <clears throat> because you have the bread of life, you're feeding and you're satisfied. Your faith and trust has made your soul fat in a good way. You're plumb and you're chubby in your soul, and that's the best kind. That's the best kind. What comes out of you is joy and contentment. We see it. We hear you saying he's enough. We hear you say he's my all in all. No other savior. Keep growing and keep feeding because it keeps glorifying the Lord. To some, you've neglected the bread of life for the crumbs of religion. You have come so close. You've tasted yet no bread of life is found in you. You want life, you want Christ, but you're on your own doing. You've come so close, yet. Notice verse 36, what Jesus tells the Jews. He says, but I said to you, you have seen me. You have seen me. They've come so close. They've come so close, and yet do not believe. They did not believe internalize. They did not. A story of a Scottish man leaving Scotland to come to America on an on a <clears throat> ocean liner. He packed his bags, put bread, cheese in it by the third day, fourth day, almost in New York. He opens up and he sees crackers stale, cheese that's gotten moldy. And he says, I wonder what it's like inside the boat, inside the dining room area, opens up the door, walks in and sees everybody laughing, joyful, the food, the drink, the buffets are all laid out. In his own self-sufficiency, he starved himself and lived on crumbs in his own cabin, rather coming in and enjoying the feast that is before us. If that's you, lay down. Lay down your self-sufficiency. Lay down, I could work and I can get this done. Lay it down. Come in. Come in. Surrender your self-striving and come in. To others, we've been feeding on husk of the muchness and the busyness of the daily life. To some, we made life's duties, service, our food, but it is nothing more than junk food and not the bread of life, but the bread of works. The bread of self-identity, you're feeding on it. And to some, even in the service of Christ, like the disciples, Mark tells us that after this, the dis after handing out bread all day long, the disciples got in the boat and their hearts were even hardened. What does that mean? You could serve the bread of life and never take it in yourself. I live there. You can make your calling, your faithfulness, your works, your ministry, your service, you can make that your bread and never taste the bread of life. If that's you, it's time to throw the husk and the crumbs of life away and come to the bread of life. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. What's beautiful in this passage is both Calvary and Bethlehem are here. Bethlehem, the house of bread, the house of bread. So when we sing, when you sing these beautiful Christmas songs and you think about Bethlehem, think about the house of bread, think about the bread of life. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you. Thank you for the feasting of the bread of life. 
thank you that you don't leave us starving. You don't leave us hungry and malnourished, but you feed us with the everlasting life, with Christ himself. We thank you, Lord, and we love you for that. And Lord, may, we, may our souls grow fat because we have the bread of life. And may we serve out of the fatness of the bread of life. I pray, Lord, your word would sink in that this life and this season that's coming upon us this next month, Father, we would not be caught up in the busyness of life, in the crumbs and in the husk of the season, but we would truly find the Savior, the bread of life. In Christ's name, amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.